Now, yesterday, hedge fund manager Jim Chanos had this to say about investing in China. What my team found, they actually came back saying uh, we're not bearish enough. Interestingly, not enough. bearish enough. No, that that in fact uh, the signs of overcapacity were even much greater than their last visit, which was late last year. And uh, increasingly, uh, the executives that they met with were sounding a little bit more uncomfortable about the current situation. I so bearish on the country, he doesn't even like Chinese food. Our next guest has a very different view, though, about China. Joining us is Robert Horrocks. He is chief investment officer of Matthews International Capital Management, which runs more than $18 billion in assets under the umbrella of Matthews Asia Fund. So, Robert, thanks for joining us. Uh, I got to ask about Jim Chanos. And today, you know, Carol spoke with Mark Faber. He's equally uh, bearish, if it's even possible, on China. You're not. Why? Well, because I think that the, uh, the argument as it's been presented by Jim Chanos and others is too extreme. If there were real overcapacity problems in China, and if there had really been a 10-year build-up of overinvestment, it would show up in so many ways. Number one, it would show up in falling returns on capital. We're not seeing it. In fact, the opposite. It, uh, it would show up in too high a level of capital stock per head of population or per unit of GDP. And in neither of these issues does, it, uh, does China look extreme. It has one-tenth uh, the amount of office space per head of population compared to the US. It has one-thirtieth the amount of installed medical but equipment. Robert, what about these pictures of these ghost cities? And people talk about so much building is being done quickly. It's not even been being done well. There's cracks and so on and so forth. That's not something to be worried about? Well, it's generally one ghost city. In, in a Mongolia um, and uh, now wait we had a camera crew Adam Johnson one of our reporters here went to China with a camera crew and saw a lot of empty buildings hotels that nobody was staying in whole villages or ta cities actually with monuments and traffic lights and no people in them well there, there is the city of Ordos yes which is a the so-called ghost city but you've got to remember it's a, it's a covers a huge area in Inner Mongolia and it actually has one and a half million inhabitants what they've been doing is building a modernized area, mm -hmm. uh, a part of that city, because they expect to see increased rates of urbanization. Now, I think that, uh, you know, they, they may have overbuilt in that city, absolutely. But uh, when you look at China as a whole, you don't see the same kind of phenomenon um, so often enough to, for it to be a, a huge problem. So are you comfortable enough that you're aggressively investing in Chinese real estate? We do invest in, in Chinese real estate. I have seen comments by Mr. Chainos to the effect that the, the financing of a lot of real estate uh, developers is far from secure or they, they, they could be over leveraged and I absolutely agree with that. Mm -hmm. so, but I just don't think you can then extrapolate from that into saying that there is a, a huge problem, a systemic I mean, problem with, with the market as a whole. And, and no bubble? Well, one thing you've got to remember about China, think of yourself as a Chinese citizen. What do I have to invest in? I can invest in bank deposits where I'm getting a negative return. I can invest in the A-share market, which is extremely volatile and therefore very risky. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm looking for long-term investments, I can look at the property market. Now, there's a real asset that people during the communist years were not allowed to own, right. something they can bring into the family, have real ownership rights over it and bequeath to their, their children. And it makes a lot of sense, given their, their relatively restricted um, avenues for investment. What about uh, outside of uh, China? I mean, you're mm -hmm. obviously running an Asia fund, so you've got to be long, I'm guessing, uh, Asian assets. What else do you like? Well, we, we focus solely on China, and what, but what we try to do is we try and take a, a long-term view and try to ask ourselves, where is the Asian economy going to be 10, 20 years down the line? And I think one of the, one of the main changes you will see in Asia is a growth in household spending, not only in the amount they spend, but in the ways that they spend it. And I'm not just talking about buying houses and cars, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about spending on leisure time, on media, on health care, on insurance, on wealth management products. And in, in, in Asia, a lot of these businesses are, are, are still in a quite incipient phase. My favorite area in Asia, branded calories. Everybody talks about how commodities are going to be um, used up in Asia uh, year after year, they, but they will be used more efficiently. The one area where Asia will use uh, commodities less efficiently is food. We got to run, and we'd love to have you back and talk some more. Robert Horrocks, Matthews Asia, Chief Investment Officer.